Um, the chair sees a quorum and we'll call the meeting to order. So today and tomorrow are going to be the, the final meetings of the task force and uh, so therefore our focus is going to be on the final report that we need to produce and um, John and his team have designed that. So the way we're structuring today and tomorrow is today is all about walking through that report. So members you'll see at your uh, desk what is called Exhibit D. And so we're going to be heavy into Exhibit D today. Uh, there won't be as much on the PowerPoint. <clears throat> For those in the uh, gallery uh, online, you can get your Exhibit D so you'll be able to walk, walk through it with us as well. Um, and then DHS is going to come after the Stephen Group walks through the report and members ask and get questions answered. They're going to give their perspective on the final report. Uh, all of that will allow us then to have whatever tweaks or changes or improvement to the draft report so that BLR can work with the Stephen Group to get the report revised and completed today so that when we come in tomorrow, we'll have a final report for us to uh, approve. And then the one other thing we're going to try and do in the two days is Representative Hammer has designed a proposal and an idea. He has sent all the members something on email. Uh, he'll talk about it tomorrow, but I just wanted to give everybody a heads up today so you can go ahead and read it. Uh, and that way when he talks about it tomorrow, we'll be able to um, assess what we want to do with that, if anything. Uh, represent uh, Senator Hendren is not going to be with us today. His uh, wife is having some surgery back in Northwest Arkansas, so we're blessed uh, with the presence of Senator Bledsoe uh, at this podium. And um, she's here today and um, is on her way. Senator, do you have any comments that you'd like to make before we move on to uh, item C? Okay. So the next thing on our agenda is adopting the minutes from the November 22 meeting. Can I get a, a motion and a second? Okay, all in favor? Any opposed? The minutes have passed. And with that, we'll ask the Stephen Group to come on up and we'll walk through the draft report, which is Exhibit D. and. With regard to questions, as they're going through these pieces, uh, members, feel free to ask the questions. And in my view, uh, rather than kind of waiting for him to get all the way to the end or anything like that, we'll try and take the questions as we go, since he's going to be moving through a lot of different areas. And I don't think there's going to be as clean a break points as we've had in some of our prior presentations. So we'll keep our eye on the electronic board here if you have questions. With that, John, if you and your team would introduce themselves, we will, uh, you can begin. Sure, thank you. Good morning, m members. John Steven, managing partner from the Steven Group. Steven Palmer, senior consultant with the Steven Group. Rory Rickert, senior consultant with the Steven Group. Richard Kellogg, senior consultant with the Steven Group. Um, thank you. I think it, as Chair Collins mentioned, Exhibit D is the exhibit that is your final report draft that I'll go through. And I want to first just take you through organizationally how it's framed and put together. Um, and then you can stop me at any time. And members of my team are here, too, to offer any questions but specific or answer any questions. But specifically, the framework itself is really section one. Um, and each of you should have the copy that has paginated. And I apologize that didn't have the original didn't have page numbers. So your copy this morning should have page numbers for you. Um, but if you look at background, just some of the findings over the past year and a half, uh, the data analysis, the findings that, that you all had, had heard through testimony um, are section one and two. And some of the key findings are broken down into the key findings of the traditional Medicaid program and also the key findings of the private option health independence program. Um, those findings are, are bulleted, and they're just some of the key findings that we're highlighting. There's no recommendation or no real vote required there. Um, then the key findings, we thought it was important across programs because we talked a lot about 
some areas that have connection to traditional Medicaid involving private option as well. Um, but Section D on page 7 are your actual votes. So I wanted to make sure we included in the draft report for you your actual votes that you have taken as a body. Um, these votes primarily are as follows, that you supported the governor's um, $835 million amount of savings over five-year plan. And important was that you said you agree that at, at a minimum um, there must be $835 million over five years. That set in, in motion the department, to their credit, really moving forward on a number of initiatives. We monitored and, and assisted and really represented you during that last year and a half. And there's been a lot of recent action that's culminated from a lot of planning in the very beginning. Um, but what's really important out of this is that, you know, that activity created the monitoring and created the final report in the five-year plan that you're going to look at today that's in the report. Representative Collins, did you have a question? Okay. The next one was you, you asked us, obviously, to, to help find, help them find those savings, but you supported the governor's negotiating waivers with CMS. Subsequent to that, there was legislation, as you know, um, and you wanted specific recommendations. So really the crux is that, that five-year report, which will be in, the, in, the, in your findings here um, or in your report. Section E is Arkansas Works. Subsequent to those votes, Arkansas Works went forward. The governor um, issued his plan. The department uh, fulfilled the, the governor's request and, and began the waiver process. And, and the good news is that waiver was, in fact, approved last week. I spoke to Director Steele uh, and her team last week, and she gave me a lot of the rundown on the waiver. She's here to, to address any questions that you may have on the actual approval of the waiver. I've listed the items in the waiver that were written, the high level. The only one that I think might be a little different is the retroactive um, change was negotiated and there's going to need to be some, some um, connection between hospital and eligibility and before CMS will actually approve the retroactive part, and Don can talk about that. But basically, Section E gives you an idea, uh, identification of what the Arkansas Works framework was. Um, it doesn't say that you support it or di don't support it. It basically just says what it is. Um, section F is the findings relative to the f fiscal cost shift. We think it's very important that this be in here. You've done a lot of work identifying. I know I remember Senator Bledsoe early on, medically frail, how many, what does it cost? There were a number of programs that were eliminated, and some of those populations and services were shifted into private option. If anything changes in the next few years that could have an impact, you need to know that there's going to be an impact on the cost shift that happened here, which is you know close to $100 million. And that's a big issue. And it's something you ought to be paying attention to as discussions on block grant or whatever happens in, in Washington going forward. So we thought it was important, and that, so that's there. We can address any questions. Again, no vote required. It's just information you collected during the hearings. And we've done a lot of that analysis for you. Um, private option for traditional Medicaid enrollment is here. Good morning, Senator. So. Um, you get an idea of where, where the latest enrollment figures are that we got. I believe it was September. I'm not quite sure the, the actual, but it was a while back, but the most recent that we received. Um, then the, expand, the, the reason why this graph on page 10 is there is, again, all information, not needing any votes. It's really to show you that the cost projections of the Arkansas waiver going forward are still the cap is still higher than the projection on the spending, so you don't at this point have a risk of go exceeding that cap. That may happen in the next few years if it's not monitored well, and DHS may have some issues with the insurance rates or whatever happens, who knows, but right now it's on a, it's on a path to continue to maintain below that cap that was negotiated by DHS and give them credit on the negotiation to be able to set that cap at the level that you can feel comfortable 
hopefully is not going to be exceeded. Um, so again, that's really background. It's a lot of information we've had in the hearings. But really, when you, when you start to talk about the recommendations that you would all have, we would begin that in Section 3. So does anyone have any questions about how that's laid out before we begin in Section 3? The, the only thing I would just add, John, is obviously with the change of administration in Washington, uh, Arkansas is going to be pursuing lots of the um, waiver options and other things that we've talked about in the past but were rejected. And, and potentially new things, as well as what the new people that will be in these positions in D.C. come up with. So uh, there's going to be a lot of activity on that. And, and my understanding is some of those discussions have already started. So one of the good, good things about having uh, our governor in, uh, in, in the big chair is we're, we're going to be on the forefront of that. And so hopefully we'll be able to make a lot of improvements. So if we start with the recommendations on Section 3, that's if you want to look at, okay, what are you going to be voting on? The recommendations are your recommendations, um, but what I what we tried to do is to be careful not to really have too much specificity, um, and also give you the flexibility. Legislation, if legislation is needed in any of these initiatives, you still could vote for the recommendations, and then the legislation is really what you're going to need to look at, determining whether you support the actual language or not. For example. We may say you recommend a care ma that DHS adopt a care management model that that develops you know the coordination for the beneficiaries. That doesn't say what model you're voting on. That just says you're recommending that approach, and that's been consistent on, at our hearings. So what we tried to capture in Section Three is remember the original what I what I said on the original vote the 835 million. That was the only thing you actually voted on to have us develop. And that's kind of what you're going to see here in Section 3. This is your five, if you want to call it your five-year savings plan that would come out of this task force. And that's what I'm prepared to go over today. But I want to just go through the framework. So you start with general, rec you know, j just a general statement. And then the Arkansas Works, the continued review section is, again, you're, all you're saying here is that you want, you want to make sure that you continue to review what's going on with the new administration and that there are a number of things that were in the report that you could look at whether you agree or not is not the issue it's just these are the areas that Arkansas may want to continue to review um, in the traditional Medicaid reform as we begin now into traditional Medicaid reform that's really the crux of these recommendations you know you have Arkansas works legislation already you have the you, you're going to continue to review what's going on in Washington on the whole issue of the, the private option, the waivers, everything, including Medicaid. But what you've really done over the past year and a half, and I think in a great effort, is to make sure that the department was held accountable in certain issues to make this department more efficient for the state and for your taxpayers and consumers, to make sure it's run like, like a business, to make sure it's run effectively and the new director that was appointed has come in and had her own transition plan, uh, transformation plan, and a lot of it all resembles what we've been discussing over a year and a half. The impetus behind that uh, happened a lot in, during our meetings and discussions, um, and we'll get into that. So when you begin your, your actual recommendations, on, it's on the savings plan now. So if you start with section, um, you know, section D, for example, we'll start the, the behavioral health savings and investments. Section E is your developmental disability savings and investments. Section uh, F is the care management model. Uh, section G is your long-term care savings plan. Section H is the pharmacy program savings. Section I is your dental managed care, which has already moved forward. Section J is the patient-centered medical home model. Um, again, you know, if you say, for example, DHS should expand the patient-centered medical home, it's, you're, you're not voting on how they're going to expand it. You're voting on that as a recommendation that would go to the legislature. And I know that um, Marty is here, and they can answer or address any the issues about legality of your findings. But 
then you, then you go to K, and section K is your recommendation on the five-year model that we're going to go over today. So K is really important because it sets in motion how, what, the, what the, plan, the model is going forward that DHS would be held accountable to if the legislature, again, were to decide to pass legislation to monitor those efforts. But you're, you're basically voting on that as a, as a recommendation to support um, meeting that $835 million plus amount of savings. So then we talk about the current models, baseline models, and we're going to go over those today. And so K is really your savings plan. And then if you, if you, you just finish with that, so that's section three. So section three is really the heart of what I believe you're going to be asked to, to really vote to recommend. It is to set a path, a roadmap, to achieve reform in your traditional Medicaid program. And that's what, we're gonna, what we've been going over in the past few months, and we're going to go over more detail momentarily on, on the savings numbers and plan. When we get to Section 4, now we're talking about other recommendations. So S Section 3 is, think of it as your roadmap for traditional Medicaid reform. And for example, Diamond Care was brought up early on. You had legislation specific on, on, a, on administrative saving service organization, independent case man management, independent assessment, all the stuff, and I reviewed Diamond Care again last night, all that stuff in Diamond Care, a lot of it is all included in that savings model in very disparate parts that DHS is already doing or starting to move forward on. You want to make sure they're held accountable on that. In my opinion, that's up to you. But your, your vote would be recommending a care management model with the savings plan with the savings plan that would give them the 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 information that this task force supports where where they're heading in terms of their review but continuing monitoring would be important okay so, so that's section three and i think that that that's clear on section three i can move into section four unless anyone has any questions on section three Are there any questions, committee? And we're going to go into Section 3 more specifically. I just want to go over the framework right now. Okay. Uh, seeing no questions, go ahead, please. So Section 4 is now your other recommendations. And, uh, and you, you should look at that differently because some of them involve savings, some of them involve investments, some of them involve just changing the way they do business. But it, there are things that are connected to the reform, and it's really important. So this has been these ideas have come up during the hearing and i'm going to go through them the first one was the eligibility enrollment framework you've heard numerous times the problems and the difficulties in the eef system we know there's already an rfp in place we know a system integrator issue is already being addressed number of things you don't want to see the overruns in the future this is merely saying you recommend that the legislature continue to monitor it um, section b is the dd waitlist we've heard all kinds of of, of information about the developmental disability waitlist. You are very concerned. I know Senator Rapert, you talked early on about that as a big issue for you and make sure if you support something, we're gonna make sure that's in here. Well, the governor came out with a plan of what, he's like, what he would like to address, that's in here. Um, and so it's merely saying you're, you're recommending that they develop a plan to provide those services. They're already working on that, but it's something that you wanted to make sure was in here. Um, you may, some of you may have other other thoughts, but I think that captures what we heard and what the governor would like to do. Organizational recommendations, we already know, and we've been meeting with them regularly, and there's a lot of organizational changes at DHS that are more streamlining approach, centralizing services, shared services model that Director Gillespie is bringing to the table. That's really this, this recommendation, supporting that, those efforts. Um, Section D is the vaccination rate issue, issue that Rory brought up early on in some of his presentation and how, how the state vaccination issues need to be looked at on, on some of the rates. Um, Section E is, is prescription limits and Rory's here to, to address. Section F is the opioid crisis issue. Again, not specifically saying what needs to be done in the terms of legislation, but you're recommending that that be addressed by the legislature. Um, or by the department, depending upon what the recommendation is. 
G is data integration efforts and decision making. And one of the big issues early on was finding a way that DHS can integrate data with other departments and identify a path to help people to work with employment security. Also looking at a comprehensive sharing of data for eligibility verification purposes as well for, to combat fraud. That merely says continue to work on that effort. Um, H is eligibility integrity, so that's related to the data sharing. Remember we did the data scrub, we had some findings, that was important to some of the members. Uh, that, that needs continued review. Um, there was testimony from NAFA representatives on the certified agent's role in the private option. We thought we agreed with some of their issues. We thought it was important that that recommendation be in your final report. Uh, the committee seemed very receptive to their, their concerns to be a part of, the, the, part of this effort in terms of assisting individuals with the private option uh, decisions. J is an independent Medicaid rate, re provider rate review. That's something that I know Senator Irvin brought up early on, and she really wanted to have some type of independent rate review. So we kept, we put that in here. Um, I think that's very important because we did a rate review for you. We found that there were some personal care rules at the, I mean, rates at the lowest level. Senator Raper, you remember on the HDC, we found at the direct care, lowest level, compared them with other states, and you guys are, maybe are paying a lot less at the frontline personal care in certain areas than your surrounding states. It's good to make sure you continue to look at that almost on a yearly basis. So that was a really good recommendation. That's in here. Again, it doesn't say specific legislation. It basically says you recommend this yearly provider rate review. How it gets implemented in the future would be something that you, know, you, you would get a chance to vote on. Um, then the Medicaid Fairness Act, and I want to make sure, I, particularly Senator Bledsoe, I know this is a concern of yours. It's important, we feel, that the Medicaid Fairness Act be amended uh, to, to reflect evidence-based practices that are going to be changing in behavioral health that if they if they have evidence-based practices that um, the, the prior authorization providers can show are met, that those that, that, that would not necessarily mean that DHS's bur burden was not rebutted. I mean, there's a burden issue here at a hearing. So this deals with fair hearings. And there's legislation that was filed last session. Some, there was different interpretations, different language. We had an agreement with some of the providers on language and we can share that with you. This does not, again, suggest any particular language. It just says it needs to be looked at and reviewed and legislation filed to address that issue. You would then be voting on that down the road. This is not the vote you would be asked in this report. Health disparities, I mean, this comes back from some of our re original meetings in the Delta, Richard and I, and, and Stephen, and a couple of the hospital access issues that we heard about, some of our research, I know um, Senator Chesterfield, Representative Murdoch, and others were very, very concerned to make sure the health disparities were addressed. That's in here. Um, and we feel it's important that there also be some type of, uh, you know, services in terms of the education component as well. Um, so that gets up to M. And M is the subcommittee recommendations. M, there are two subcommittees that you guys formed the task force form, one was the DRG um, and one was the HDC subcommittee. You had Senator Ingram and Representative Farrar on the DRG and you had Senator Rapert and Representative um, Hammer on the HDC. Both committees met, number of meetings, issued recommendations, they're in here. Um, the HDC committee had a number of meetings in the field as well. All of their recommendations in their preliminary report are in this document. So that, that in a nutshell um, is what this document is about and this is what you would be, how you would be voting. So, you know, I can take any other questions or I can go into the savings plan. So section three, Representative Collins, is kind of where our team wanted to start the discussion. And then section three, you can decide on the vote, how you're gonna deal with the voting and the review or whatever else, if, that, if that's okay with you. Okay. So we're gonna first look at, I wanna go back on the PowerPoint slide. This is the recommendation K in section three. Does everyone have this?
So this recommendation basically reads, the task force recommends and supports that the Arkansas DHS develop and implement a five-year Medicaid program savings plan that is in excess of $835 million in net savings to the trend proposed by Governor Asa Hutchinson starting no later than July 1, 2017. Savings must be achieved through an increase in care management and coordination, resulting in improved outcomes, quality, appropriate utilization based on need, reduction of duplication and unnecessary services, and the introduction of value-based purchasing strategies and some degree of provider risk. There are different models of risk, so it didn't want to say what the level of risk would be. The Department of Human Services will provide a comprehensive Medicaid budget savings dashboard report tracking savings to trend to the Bureau of Legislative Review or research every quarter commencing September 1st, 2017, and thereafter for five years. And that's, again, that's what you're recommending. There would still need to be legislation. And I don't know if, Representative Collins, you wanted to talk about that, but that's my understanding. I think you can go ahead and talk about it. Okay. Well, um, my understanding is a vote today is really to vote on the recommendation of the, of the roadmap for DHS to get to where they could achieve the $835 million. Um, so we're going to start with... Yeah, so, so and, and again, we'll probably have Marty up at, at some point as we're, just to make sure we're clear on, you know, what exactly this report means and what exactly it means to us. I, I'm going to give you my understanding. So, you know, we've, we've, we've agreed on this goal over five years. Uh, John and his team and DHS and, and all of us and other committees have been working on implementing that. So in a lot of senses, this is a continuation of that. Uh, anything that would require legislative approval, of course, will have to go through the normal legislative process. So th there's nothing that we're going to vote on that has the force of law like legislation and then things that um, direct and guide DHS um, also don't have the force of law from a task force perspective. So it's that distinction between um, a direction or a roadmap uh, or a process uh, that we're talking about versus, you know, the force of law that we're used to dealing with uh, when we pass legislation. So that's a sense for what we're doing here as, as I understand it. Does that sound right to you, John? Yes. Yes. Um. So I think if we go through this, you're going to see there's a lot of activity, though, that's already ongoing, and it's reflected in some of these numbers and projections. So, and it is as a result of a lot of your hearings and discussions and meetings and, and, and impetus to push the department in a direction, and then Director Gillespie, um, to her credit, has endorsed or embraced a lot of your um, concerns during those hearings and some of the things we've been doing. So. Um, this is what this reflects. But what, what we wanted to do is to start with a baseline so you'll all get an idea of where, where you are. And remember, we always were targeting that 5% growth factor each year. And that's something we told you early on was the 10-year CMS projection, and, and also OMB was close, 5, 55 6% in some research. But it was re we decided the 5% was what we were going to use. And I think the most recent um, information we received from the department was last year, they were somewhere around 6% um, growth. So it's very much in line, and yet the, the, the real efficiencies haven't started yet on terms of some of these savings models or savings initiatives. So I think you're, you're in a good place for these to really start to change and transform your program. So that's why you want to make sure you have that baseline in place. So we're, the first line here is the baseline. So you can continue to monitor that baseline on a gross amount, and you could see at the end of the five-year period, uh, 2017, um, to actually 2000, starting J July 2017, but this is all in fiscal year. Um, you can see at the end of that five-year period, we're, we're going to look at $31 um, billion on traditional baseline spending. So $31 billion dollars and then what I wanted to make sure Stephen had also included was the Arkansas Works. So before we get into that, you're going to see each line is going to have your baseline is $31 billion. 
your current model. Now this is if the next line where it's 30 billion, 244, you're gonna see some savings there from the 208. So 31, 208, you're gonna see some savings. You're gonna hear about those savings later on. It's close to you know, 900 plus, nine, I think it's like somewhere around 900 plus million dollars. But those savings are gonna happen based on the current changes and current model that is happening at DHS, all of these initiatives that are gonna be planned to save from that 5% trend. Now that does not take into consideration the care coordination, care management model, and that will increase the savings numbers. So if it's a provider-led model, you're gonna see the savings would be even greater, and if it was a capitated managed care for those two high-cost entities, behavioral health and DD, the savings would be even greater there. And we'll go through those for you. But in the end, if, if you add either the provider-led model or the capitated managed care to the de development, disability, and behavioral health area, bring in that care coordination component, your savings is gonna be in addition to the current programs they have in place at DHS or are moving towards. Does everyone follow that? Any questions? Okay. The next line is your Arkansas Works. So the projection of Arkansas Works over this, the same time period is approximately um, $10 billion plus. And I wanted to make sure that was added to the traditional Medicaid because then you can get a flavor for your entire Medicaid program. And so if you add that to your baseline in your traditional, you're dealing with 41 billion 415 over that time period. And then you start putting the savings in place and you can get a chance to see where you, where you would go with those reductions. Again, all coming off of that 5% baseline. So this is pretty, this is pretty much your, your, your tra overall global tracking sheet. Now we get into the current model. Remember I said that the, they're moving forward and we've already had many hearings to address a number of these issues. So in the development disability area, in the departments here, and the way the agenda is structured is for them to comment on these savings initiatives after our presentation. So the development disability area, we met last week with Melissa Stone and her team and came to an agreement for example, on some of the issues involving screening and tiers, and it was a very productive meeting. And, they, and we, we, we basically exemplified what Richard and I got out of that meeting in here in this plan. So $18 million in therapy caps, uh, $14 million a year for screenings for children, which is gonna impact the CMHS and DDTCS programs, um, all with, you know, still sticking with the medical necessity requirements and prior authorization that they're putting in place, what you heard from the department in past meetings. Independent assessment is already on, on the way. The only issue on the independent assessment for developmental disability is it's not going to um, happen as quickly as the independent assessment for behavioral health rollout. We may need to change some of those dates, but they wanna, they wanna basically run through a year of of um, doing, seeing where, where they would be in the area of tiers before they actually set the, set the plan in motion and then they can talk more about that. So the savings are pushed out on the DD side for independent assessment resulting into the tiers and plan of care a little further out. But it's still gonna happen. They're already in motion and there's some administrative costs as well that we put in the model. Behavioral health, you've heard ample testimony, lengthy testimony about group psychotherapy changes, about the transformation. The good news is the behavioral health transformation, I understand passed maybe yesterday as far as the first rule movement, which DHS committed to you. I remember Senator Hendren was really making sure that they would do this by the end of this task force term, and the rules went through yesterday. I'm not sure if it was the first, first um, run, and they may need to go to another committee, but Don can answer that. But the bottom line is, that, that has started and it's gone through. The group psychotherapy rate changes, I understand, did not pass. So we need to make some changes on some of our savings in this model. I found out that yesterday. But the group psychotherapy uh, cap that we talked about with prior authorization ha has already gone through, which is gonna achieve savings. 
So it's only a small adjustment we're going to need to make before tomorrow. Um, but a lot of this is all in your behavioral health changes that are going to happen. The $108 million investment over five years is going to be that care coordination model and behavioral health. Remember, you're going to have you know 20,000 plus in the in the in the child area, maybe 30,000 adult. I'm not sure the exact numbers. Richard can tell you the numbers, but you got a number of people here in tier two, tier three, that are going to need that type of of care coordination into your in alignment with your pa patient-centered medical home. So that's again when I mentioned earlier, Diamond Care had some. Those are some initiatives that already were kind of in the works that you wanted in place. That's going to happen, and. Um, that's already in the plan. Dental, dental RFP, the, the dental providers were chosen. Um, there's still a, what they call a, uh, a protest period. So I'm not sure what DHS can say at this point, but that's, that's moving forward. They expect January of 18, I believe it's January of 18 to launch instead of what we had originally um, want it was the July 17 so there's going to be a readiness review period which is not not a nor not ab abnormal and unusual in the managed care world so we may have to go back and just change five million in our, our savings numbers to maybe two and a half million for that first year so some of these things are evolving and we want to make sure again we told you a long time ago that the projections evolve but you know you're only talking a few million dollars versus the larger amounts. It's not going to make much of a change. Elder, we know that the nursing home industry is working with um, Director Cloud and his team and already has the MOU in place and that's well on the way and they're going to achieve savings this year of roughly I think approximately 15 million dollars by the July 1st 2017 from trend based on nursing home bed reductions um, planned and some in place. Um, pharmacy Rory can talk about that, but I, I want to make special, I, I do want to take special time, Senator, I mean, Representative Collins and Senator Blitzel with Rory Rickard for my team. Um, you know, we've all worked hard with the department to try to make sure that they are working hard to achieve your objectives. And there are oftentimes I'll, I'll be asked, what has the task force accomplished in terms of savings? Uh, this is one area where you all should be very proud of. Representative Boyd, you too, for your help. Um, because there wasn't a lot of activity that was actually, it's not that they weren't moving forward at DHS, there was a lot of not following, not, make, not thinking out of the box to move beyond regulations and rules, Rory can talk about that, but they have done a great job at DHS with the director there in working with us to bring about meaningful changes just in some rules and regulations and areas that are going to bring $50 million a year in savings. Um, and as a result of this task force, and I, if it's okay, I just yeah. wanted Rory to Yeah, why don't, Rory, why don't you go ahead and do that, and then uh, after you're finished, we'll recognize Representative Boyd for a question. Great, thank you. Um, as John said, our early work, sort of investigative work uh, with the department uh, revealed a couple areas where it, it felt to us, our team, that sort of local rules and regs were in the way of maximum program efficiency. And so, Working collegially with the department, uh, we tried to set in motion efforts to get those uh, hurdles out of the way and allow programs to deliver the sort of maximum efficiency that they could. And in the um, section three, the pharmacy subsection H, the hard savings uh, delivered by the pharmacy program, those savings uh, look to be about a third of our total team's $900 million in savings, although pharmacy doesn't represent a third of your total Medicaid spend. So that one sub-department was able to sort of outdo its percent of the total spend in savings delivered. And, and the quality of the program is going to stay the same or improve, improve in some areas. Representative Boyd had a question. That's a great success story. And uh, I was glad to hear you use the word collegially. I used that word once in a business meeting, and everybody thought I made it up. Glad to hear someone else use it. Re Representative Boyd, you're recognized for a question. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, just, I, I guess I have a little bit of a concern. So it seems like pharmacy as a profession has come to the table, you know, specifically community pharmacy, and said, hey, we want to work with you to find legitimate cost savings. Um, 
But earlier when we started meeting, there were things said like a prescription is generally considered an inexpensive intervention that could save money other places. We've discussed the issue of immunizations and right now currently DHS pays for immunizations on the medical side, but what if that happens? So I guess what I'm expressing to you is my concern is we have a group of people that you've acknowledged have worked with you, worked with DHS to come up with legitimate savings, potentially a disproportionate share of those savings, but it's not really focused on here's where we're going to do it. Here's this $250 million. So what that does is a group that is working with you, now three years from now, if all of a sudden slot limits are removed on statin drugs or slot limits are removed on blood pressure medicine or, or some other thing where it, it presumptively would save money somewhere else, it puts that group at risk of being singled out and saying, oh, well, well where's your $50 million this year? So I guess what I'm asking is could you consider would it be that much trouble to go back and say, okay, well, here are the areas like expanding the PDL, the, the cap list, and actually going back and defining them since this is the, the final report? And that's really all I have to ask. And Representative Boyd, the, the things that generate what I would say are hard savings, and a good example would be expansion of the PDL classes, are included in the $250 million in five-year savings. The other things, uh, vaccination rates, which could involve increase in payment to providers, um, the changing in the prescription slot limits for uh, maintenance medications, and then some of the changes around opioids. Um, the savings measured in those likely happen in a person's long-term medical spend, not in that calendar year's pharmacy spend. So those, are, those were harder to quantify. I, I would consider those softer savings and softer because they're harder to measure. And we did not include those in the, in the roadmap in the $250 million in savings. They're still in a, in a <laughs> section four of the report, kind of other recommendations to be considered, but we didn't tally up a, a number for those. Representative Boyd, let me uh, let, let me, I want to make sure that I'm grasping your question because what, what I, when I interpreted from your question was a little bit of with the pharmacy savings coming through now at these levels, phar pharmacies really made all of the efficiency effective improvements that are there. So five years from now, if someone comes and says, well, geez, you gave me 50 million a year before, give me another 50 million a year. Your point is pretty much, hey, we've already come to the well with the full Monty. We, we don't have another 50 million in the tank to do something else with, and you're looking to have details specifically where that came from in this report. Did I grasp that correctly? Representative Collins, I think that's a very valid point. I, let, me, let me just take it a little bit further. So the, the point is, is if this money came out of expanding the PDL, okay, and so we, we saved the $50 million, or, or pharmacy saved the $50 million, but the, the challenge is then all of a sudden Medicaid starts paying for more prescription drugs because we believe it's going to save money elsewhere. When we're looking at these in silos, that, that sets somebody up to look bad. That, that's what I'm trying to say is we're looking at DD in a silo, BH, behavioral health in a silo, look, we're looking at everything in a silo, but really from the taxpayer standpoint, they don't care about an individual spend. They care about how much money's coming out of his or her wallet. And so I'm just asking if, if there's a legitimate but not overly complex way to kind of say we expect expanding the PDL to save this much money, we expect the cap list to save this much money, if we could get that back into the, the final report so if that I, we could, if we could can, see how that's doing. If I can add to that, I think what we could do, because we did, there's like three meetings ago, we had that designation, each line item. If we take that slide, because the numbers may have changed somewhat, and we'll have to go back over the numbers, but if we take that, we can put that right in the recommendation under Section H, because that's where it's where it is. It's all about those, it's more of a global recommendation. So we can be more specific underneath it with that spreadsheet, if that could work. And that spreadsheet would identify each of those line items and the amounts in each category. I think that's what I'm asking. Okay. Thank you. That'll be done. Wonderful. Representative Hammer, you recognize for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. John, I want to, you just complimented 
the pharmacy group for coming together under Representative Boyd's leadership, working with everybody to identify what sounds like the most significant contribution proportionate to the overall groups working together on this. So w did we, and I know we've had a lot of discussion, I'm just trying to clarify my mind, did we not go to all the other groups and get equally proportionate amount of savings returned as well? or? as far as finding the barriers that you referenced that were broken down in the pharmaceutical side, did we not also go forward and find barriers to be broken down in the other groups as well? No, I, th I think you'll see here, and especially the one we just went over, the DD and the behavioral health area. I mean, absolutely, these groups not only provided, the providers provided ideas and, and savings initiatives, um, recommendations early on in the process. We included those in some of our report. We did our own independent analysis. The departments met with those stakeholders. So uh, they all have come forward, absolutely. I think what Rory is saying is in the pharmacy area, we were very uh, impressed with the fact that they've gone beyond even what we had earlier thought was achievable and really looked out of the box in, 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 in a way that we just didn't really feel um, early on. We didn't we didn't contemplate. R Rory? And Representative Hammer, I, I don't know if you recall, but maybe about 10 meetings ago, this, this topic of equal savings uh, compared to your contribution to a total dollar of Medicaid spend kind of came up as a discussion. And we cautioned you not to have that to be the barometer by which you measure the final output. Because, for example, maybe we couldn't achieve uh, the same amount of savings in the dental program as we did in the pharmacy program. So that would have been an unfair starting goal. Instead, I think we took each department, kind of each of the major savings initiatives individually and tried to maximize them. Well, and that's, that's part of what I wanted to clarify because I think, don't get me wrong, I think everything is great, you know, especially Representative Boyd's leadership on helping identify additional savings that could be, you know, achieved in the pharmaceutical side. I just want to make sure the message was clearly communicated that that proportionate to the amount that they could, everybody at this stage of the game has given about as much as they're able to give, and that we we have achieved that goal. Is that a fair statement to make? I mean, I think it is. I think every every stakeholder group, every area, yeah, I do. But I also feel like I need to say going forward, and this is why this roadmap is so important for you all. I mean, you're going to be in the legislature next year. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, Republican, whatever, whatever you're thinking, who, 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 which area of the recommendation you like. At the end of the day, someone has got to make sure that these things continue. Or one rule, you know, one committee saying no to a rule in March or April could really jeopardize this. One change to the PDL could really jeopardize this. Um, and you're not going to be in existence. So that's why this roadmap is so critical and somebody's got to make sure, or committee, or group, or whatever, from the legislative standpoint. And I can tell you, sitting here, Representative Hammer, I feel very good that the director at DHS is is basically in almost full agreement with this and moving forward in your and her combined roadmap. So um, no matter what the care management model is, you can feel comfortable. But things can change come January, February, March, if it's not continued legislative, at least not so much involvement like in the past, but just oversight and the, review. The sense okay. I have is that a couple areas like pharmacy and uh, seniors with the MOU, that there seems to be a lot of clarity and you know fairly substantial numbers of $50 million a year. And, and, and those are plans where it seems like we really have a fantastic line of sight into how we're going to deliver the numbers at goal or above goal. And, and, and those are very exciting. Yep. The, the others, you know, frankly, even if you just look at the sheet you've got here, there's, a, there, there's not, ne not nearly as clear that, you know, here was the goal and here's where they are. And, and there still seems to be a lot of arm wrestling. Uh, yesterday you just mentioned, you know, we had a rule to change the per unit uh, allocation, I think, from $13 to $10, and that rule didn't happen, and, and, and it is going to have a substantial effect. And, and so there's still a lot of arm wrestling. And, and where the arm wrestling is, you know, is it in the legislature? Is it at DHS? Is it with providers? I, I'm not trying to pass judgment on that, but, 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 but two areas seem to have this clarity, line of sight, plan in motion, 
plan moving forward. Others, there still seems to be arm wrestling. And that, it's, not, it's not a judgment statement. I, to me, that just seems like a statement of the situation that we have, a statement of fact. Is that a fair assessment? I, I, I think it is. I think it is. I think, yeah, and I, I guess what I'm trying to underscore, you mentioned the long-term care area in the very beginning of your statement. So um, Mr. Norsworthy was here last time, and I think Representative Farrar, some, uh, Representative Hammer, Representative Hammer asked, well, what happens if you don't meet those savings? Well, we're going to meet them. Well, what happens if you don't? And you have to trust the agency that they are going to recognize the holdback provisions that they've been talking about that is going to happen. And, and a lot of it is built on trust as well as, and if the legislature is not involved and walks away is what I'm saying, you know, it, it's just, it's going to be difficult to, to make sure that that trust happens, in my opinion. But DHS, feel good that DHS is absolutely adhering to um, what you want, what you, your objectives are here. Senator Irvin, you're recognized for a question. Thank you. I, I just wanted to follow up on what Representative Boyd was discussing because, because I think making it clear as statements, clear statements in the report that, I mean, because we've discussed this with the pharmacy, if we can, uh, you know, one of the things we've talked about is the limit of, of prescriptions. And sometimes if you have a limit of seven prescriptions, what we're finding is, and we have a great person that's working in pharmacy with our department, and thank you for those words because he is great. And just, you know, seeing that that is, that is preventing us from keeping people out of the hospital if we can actually manage their meds a little bit better. And so just having those statements, I mean, I think he has a great point. Representative Boyd had a great point. It's hard to kind of figure out, well, this savings is actually going to appear over here because we were able to manage their medications because we were able to lift that seven prescription per month limit, which then allows them to take their beta blockers or to manage that diabetes or that high blood pressure or whatever it is, because our limits was actually hamstringing us because of, of that rule. So I love the action that's going on there, but I think Representative Boyd, you're right on that if you if you put that in the silo or a column, it may appear that savings is going to appear somewhere else. You just want to make sure that it's accounted for somewhere, um, or there's a statement there. And so I I just wanted to follow up on that part of the conversation because you're absolutely right. And some of those changes that are being made in pharmacy, you're going to realize savings in all these other areas because we're able to manage their meds a lot better. So. I just, I just wanted to chime in on that, and, uh, and I do appreciate the rate review. I think that's really important, particularly for immunizations with providers. Thank you. Representative Meeks, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There is some concern that I have because you say, you know, this all fits together. This is a roadmap. You say we've, we've got to follow through on this. You know, if one piece doesn't get passed, then it could jeopardize everything else. And of course, we know that the federal government is the kind of the unknown in this, what they're going to do. Are they going to repeal this? Are they going to actually change that? So, you know, as we go forward with this particular thing, can you kind of um, go into how the federal government uh, might affect what we're trying to do? Uh, what, what areas may be the most vulnerable to what the federal government would allow us or not allow us to do, depending on changes that, that may be made within this new administration? Um, it's, it's a difficult question because nobody knows that answer. But I'll tell you my thoughts. I mean, the roadmap is st you still ha are going to, they're not going to get rid of categorical eligibility. They're not going to get rid of the Social Security Act. They're not going to get rid of the things that you have to do to make sure you take care of the most vulnerable citizens. And they may give you flexibility in how you do that. So it may even be able, DHS may now even have more ability to achieve greater savings because they may be able to now move, uh, like for example, we've been talking a lot about, Melissa Stone's mentioned on her waiver for, to get to the tiers. I mean, how long has that been taken with discussions back and forth with CMS and reviews and this and that? And the department sometimes is, is and not just this department, but this is all over the country. Dep states are sometimes paralyzed to want to move because they're afraid that CMS might say, react in a certain way, or they may say, well, CMS told us over the phone that we can't do this without challenging them. 
without going to a higher authority to making sure. But if, see, if the federal government is such, now they're saying to states, you design and create the framework. Here's a, here's a set of money like TANF or, or um, you know, a block grant. Here's a set of dollars. Here's based on what you're spending. You, re you design the program. We'll make sure you're accountable for the law, meeting the law. That, it just, that sets up a whole new ability to really be flexible and improve upon some of this. But the roadmaps, in my opinion, would still be there. So you don't see anything right now on the horizon as far as the federal government is concerned, um, them coming up with changes or new restrictions or new regulations that might jeopardize this roadmap? Um, not on the traditional Medicaid. I don't. Right away, I don't. On the, on the private option, possibly. Possibly getting rid of the ex essential, essential health benefits, those 10 benefits right away. Getting rid of them, let, letting states be more creative, making designing designing um, uh, plans to meet needs. I mean, yeah, right away. And but this traditional Medicaid reform we're talking about, I, I don't see. I only see that. I see that roadmap still being in place. Okay, and I guess final question is because you know if if Washington does what they say they're going to do and, and repeals, you know, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. Again, we we don't know number one what they're going to replace it with. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, prior to the Arkansas Works, we didn't cover people up to 100% as far as our Medicaid plan. So if we go back to the default, then pretty much that whole population, uh, you know, they don't have health insurance and they cannot go on the Medicaid program. Um, and again, if that happens, are there other aspects of this, whether it's behavioral health or you know, DD or whatever the case may be, that uh, again yes. would jeopardize yes. what we're yes. we're trying to do. It, again, I, I said this earlier. It won't jeopardize what you're trying to do. Okay. It won't. What it will involve is a cost shift back to the program. The match would change, and your baselines would all have to change. And it's going to involve more costs. And your savings may be, you know, similar, but your savings are going to be off a much higher baseline if some of those costs are put back into the traditional, and populations are put back into traditional Medicaid. But they're still going to, they're still going to be required to go through the independent assessment and some of the changes you're making here anyways. So, but yeah, if, if some of those populations are back in traditional and some of the services, um, that baseline, that baseline all has to change. But while, but while we're speculating, John, isn't the, the woman that is going to be in charge of CMS, isn't she the woman that basically helped Governor Pence, you know, adapt his own version, his own version of the private option for Indiana? Isn't that the woman that's going to be running CMS in the future? Yes, yes, and uh, Seema Verma. Verma. Um, you know, I, I actually spoke to her on your behalf when Senator Chesterfield had a concern about it was something to do with the power account, and someone didn't pay um, for their pay f for their certain power account, and when they they took away some benefits, and what the impact was. If you remember that whole discussion we had, we had slides, and uh, you know they 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 saw a more positive response and reactions. People started paying into their power accounts. People were more involved, more transparency. So I think, um, or more personal responsibility. I think you're going to see from her is an. Uh, just more personal responsibility. I, I think that's what she believes. That's what I've heard from talking to her on my own. Um, but yeah, again, we can sit here and speculate, but I'm trying to, Representative Meeks, give you the roadmap here. But I, you know, if the, if the populations and the services go back into traditional Medicaid, I mean, maybe Don would be able to answer that question. It's gonna, it's gonna really change the baseline. Right, but I, I would guess in this case that's why it's imperative that we follow this roadmap so that we can get the savings that we need to, you know, that if we have to pull some of these folks back into traditional Medicaid because something is repealed, Great point. then we have the savings. Maybe we have a little bit of leeway to be able to actually do that. It's a great point. And uh, if they give you the flexibility to use the funds, you can then design packages to meet certain needs, catastrophic packages. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, but that, that's, uh, that underscores, it's a great point. It underscores why don't stop. Keep going on this in this direction, in our opinions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's amazing if you have flexibility, you have options. Senator Irvin, you're recognized for a question. 
I'm sorry, just a quick question. I know that we're speculating, but you just said that the the power accounts and things like that, when when I originally wrote those into the private option, but we did away with them upon your recommendation because they were not managed correctly. But you're saying that that might be something that we would consider. Yeah, that, it was a little different than the power account but okay. framework, but it was the stick that they had in the Indiana. They had okay. the stick. Okay. And you didn't have the stick. Okay. And yeah, there were we some other allowed. issues. And I know Senator Chesterfield asked me specifically, did that stick work? And that's when I called SEMA and asked her, and she gave me some background information that the stick in Indiana did work. Okay. And people were paying into that account, and people were using the resources appropriately. And there was a small amount that weren't that were actually removed for a short period of time. Okay. And yeah, she was, yeah, the, she CMS was the architect behind that. Okay, CMS wouldn't allow that when we negotiated um, that CMS with CMS allowed for Indiana, just know the, the current administration, because it was a grandfather. Gotcha. Okay, it thank you. It was a grandfather from thank the you. prior. Thank you. So um, there's a lot of numbers here. Se and Senator it, Chesterfield, if you'd push your button again for us, and you're recognized for a question. Thank you so much, since we're in speculative heaven here. Um, the uh, president-elect has said that he will not do away with the current program until he has one in place, which is substantially different from what uh, the Speaker of the House and the majority leader in the Senate have kept proposing over the past year or so, or two or three or forever. Um, the individual uh, who has been appointed, does that person have knowledge of of how, or have you heard them express how they would change it before they replace it? Yes, um, rep but not currently, but Representative Price, who's going to be the HHS commissioner, has a, um, <laughs> I don't know if it's 800 pages, but I've read maybe a couple hundred, but very detailed roadmap on where he wanted to go in his legislation with a lot of tax tax uh, savings accounts and health savings accounts and changing the whole program. So he's already got that. I'd be happy to share that with you. That's, mm -hmm. That was his thinking. He already generated that into a bill, and I forget exactly what they, what he referred to it as. But I will, I will make sure the chair gets a copy of that. And, but and when you talk about VEMA, SEMA, mm -hmm. just so you know, SEMA, the woman who we were talking about, Senator, is the CMS director now. So she would be reporting to Senator uh, Representative Price. I see. And that's wonderful. Um, I'm just so looking forward to all of this. Um, could you please? <laughs> My heart beats rapidly. Um, please tell me what was repealed each and every time that this was sent. Tell me about three things that were repealed uh, every time it was sent to the President's desk and he vetoed it. Um. You mean in the in the in the like the Ryan bill and uh -huh. some of the other bills? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know all the specifics, but I know the Can you just essential give me benefits, the essential health benefits mm -hmm. were a big one, and also the um, the mandate was a big issue as well. And so, you know, the individual Which mandate, mandate, the individual mandate. Oh, okay, gotcha. Thank you. But there's a lot of. But there were a lot of things that were also left alone. Correct. And I think that's important to look at as well. Correct. Even in the Ryan McConnell thing, yes. there were a whole bunch of yes. things that were left in place. And yes. our best shot then, you would suggest, is that we go ahead with what we're doing because the legislative process at the federal level is even more slow yes. than the legislative process here in the state of Arkansas. Uh, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I, you're on the right track, and I, I agree with you, Senator. Senator Elliott, were you raising your hand? Would you push your button, please? <laughs> Senator Elliott, you recognize for a question. <laughs> Thank you. About the Indiana stick, whoever was, I think someone was talking about that. Uh, what, was, um, what was the baseline measure that it was measured against to show that, to, to uh, show how it worked and that it does work? I mean, I will, I'm going to go, have to go back, Representative, because mm -hmm. I have, I, I, we wrote in the status report pretty detailed number. We gave you numbers, uh -huh. and she had sent me all that information. And so I'd have to go back into the status report to get. Well, to I might report. not be asking for that much detail, because uh, I, I, because I'm really, it's not a detailed question. I don't think. I mean, okay. there was some somebody doing something somewhere, then somebody did something differently. Right. So, um, 
Yes. What was it measured against is all I'm asking, not for it, numbers. Based, I don't know, but the numbers are important there to look at because that's where you yeah. can see the impact. Right. So there were, there were a small amount, there were individuals that were not paying into their power account. Mm -hmm. And they were going to use the power account to do cost sharing at an ER or some type of cost share at, at, at the, um, medic, any mm -hmm. medical facility. Right. And then if they adhered to certain other PCP visit and things that they wouldn't be penalized. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that penalty would revert to where you would be taken off the program for a certain amount of time mm -hmm. if you continue to not pay mm -hmm. and not participate. And then that ended up being only a small number of individuals that were actually terminated mm -hmm. from the program. Most of them continued to pay and most of them adhered to the, the policy and the plan. And that's all in that spreadsheet and the numbers that we put in the task force because she had sent those to me. So I, I, without knowing those exact numbers, when I say small, those not, the, the number of people that were impacted by that mm -hmm. were small to the extent that SEMA had told me personally on that call that she felt the stick worked. Okay, and, and that's, that's all what, I'm saying. Yeah, that's all I'm, I'm trying to figure out too. That do we? She felt the stick work. Do we know that's the case because there was a control group? Is I guess is what I'm yeah, asking. We have the previous, and then it, uh, in that report, and in in where it has changed. The, okay, all right. Uh, I will I will try to go back and find out more for you on that. No, that, that's all. I just wanted to have clarity on not assuming something happened because it's a stick that would have happened anyway. That's what I was trying to think about, uh, that kind of measure, and not I just assume it, that that was the reason it happened. It's a really good question. I, okay. I want to look back at it. All right. All right. Thank you. But, but just to make sure I understand, John, your general point was that she believes in carrots and sticks. Was that really the, the, the broader point? She was very adamant about that. And yeah, carrots and sticks. She and believes in it generally, whether in a particular place the data was there or not. Yeah, okay. Got it. All right. Well, that's all the questions we've got for now. So if you want to go ahead and continue. Um, so when we get into the, this is in your, um, this is in your report. I just want to make sure page, I think we start at page uh, 19 and go through 21. We're going to get into detailed numbers, but if you need to, um, I'm going to go real quick here if you want to ask any questions, but I think it's important that you at least see some of these numbers. We may make some adjustments based on what I had told you earlier. Um, and we need DHS, obviously, to come up and, and answer your questions on whether or not they agree with some of these savings estimates. These are estimates. There are some assumptions built into this. But this is where you get your, if you look at the very end, Senator Hendren was always one, uh, wanted to make sure we were able to tell you what the net net was, that that was a big issue for him to make sure you take all the investments out, you look at anything that um, is going to be increased cost for administration. Um, and so based on just do, continuing on the roadmap they're continuing to do at DHS, we feel over that fiscal, from fiscal 18, which just starts July 2017 to the end of uh, 22, that they will, they will achieve $963 million in savings. And then we go through line by line. Let's, let's go through quickly. The therapy caps, you heard a lot about the therapy caps. I know Senator Chesterfield was concerned about prior authorization, and that's something that they told you they're putting in place. But there was enough in there that we looked at, and we looked at the percentage of what we thought would be um, approved, disapproved, even re very reasonable. $18 million in savings is not unreasonable. And we felt that was important. The department agreed to that number. And to start in 17, so July 17 it would start, so it's reflected in fiscal 18. Um, the, the screenings for children. I, I know that, you know, Representative Gray, you asked a lot of questions about this. Um, this is the DDTCS and CH, CMHS areas where we think that screening with PCPs could make a big difference to give them a referral and let them follow the roadmap. It's not exactly the waiver changes I think that you had questioned about, but those are going to be coming down the road. And I, you know, I'd let Melissa and the department answer those. But what the department agreed to was that they are moving forward on a new screening, um, set, not assessment, I don't want to look at it like an assessment, but it's really just screening for primary care physicians so that a referral can be made with knowledge and the right referral being made versus today without any type of screening that, that the referral is, is being made without. So 
Uh, the department can answer more specifics, and Richard was in the meeting, and you may want to answer any questions. But I know that was an important area. It was a change from our last meeting, and they've agreed to that $14 million. We did some review of the numbers and felt that that's achievable. Representative Gray, you recognized for a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Apologize for my voice today. One of the things I think that I've that we felt, I say we, I felt was important coming into this task force was doing independent assessments across all areas. So based on the numbers that you have up there, does that include true independent assessments for DDTCS in the state plan amendments? We're going to have those for the waiver services based on the RFP that's already been put out. But what about true independent assessments for DDTCS? That is something that I wanted to see as well. Um, I think that the department is going to have to answer that question on a yes or no basis. What I can tell you is, is that the screening that they intend to have performed, it's an American Academy of Pediatrics screen, developmental screening assessment for zero to five age group, I believe. Um, will be done by the PCP, and as John said, currently the PCP simply makes a referral. The intended impact of that assessment, along with physician education on other referral sources of other services that are available for children that may not need DTCS or CHMS levels of services, is combined together. The intention is to reduce the number of PCP re, uh, referrals directly to the DDTSC in, in uh, CHMS program. The benefit limit caps is the major construction on cost savings, as you can see, across uh, these services in those two programs. Any request for additional services beyond the benefit caps is going to get an independent review. Okay, what, I, I think so these, these numbers I, essentially don't include true independent I, assessments. I think I'd like the department to answer yeah. that because the independent assessment RFP did include the DDC, DTCS program, but when we asked that question, they weren't clear exactly on how that's all going to be part of that independent assessment. So I didn't want to mark any savings. I didn't want to, I, I want them to be able to address that. In okay. fairness to the department, there, there is a dearth of screening assessment tools for the zero to five year age population for these types of services. Um, so I think that, that this is somewhat of a work in progress in academic research. Uh, I think the fact that they're going to the American Academy of Pediatrics is about as high as quality as you're going to be able to do at this point. Um, th these types of services are not adult daily functioning or child functioning level services. They're basically communication, physical movement uh, services. And I, so I think that, that, that they're going to have to respond directly. But as far as an instrument like the SIS or the ICAP or, or the locus of CANS and mental health, the, the, there aren't any standardized assessment instruments, to my knowledge, specifically for this set of services for this age group. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Did we want to bring them up now to answer those questions or wait until after? Um, what, what I think we'll do, if it's okay with you, Representative Gray, is uh, they're going to be responding to this overall, and so they're going to be up there, and let's make sure we do this, and, <clears throat> and, and you can, we can even start off with this question when they come up, and the reason is because we're going to be getting ready to break for lunch when we get to a break point in this discussion, uh, you know, in the next 20 minutes, and, uh, and so rather than having a different group come back and forth, but we'll definitely get at that question. I think we definitely need to get the answer to it. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Representative Gray, it's a great question. It's just I, we can we before the final report, we can change anything in here. We can you know we can add numbers, we can take numbers off. I just want to make sure whatever we put in here that we feel comfortable for you that this is what the department has indicated they could achieve. Um, the w tier changes, you know, I we we really feel comfortable that they are moving in the direction that you've wanted. The three tiers. Uh, we put that in the report. They may have some, I heard they may have some concerns about the Tennessee tiers. Um, we didn't say specifically follow Tennessee. We said like Tennessee. So it just gives them a framework um, to look at. 
and that's something they can address with you. But the fact is, they are moving forward on the tiers. Um, they want to run through a year where they're not going to actually change the cap allotment. They're going to see what the tiers show, and then they want to move to what my understanding was to the full program. So we extended those savings out a year. So those savings you'll see here um, do not start to accrue until fiscal 20. So, you know, if you want them to jump up on that earlier in time, you can talk to them about it. But again, we're, we're comfortable where, where DHS is thinking right now um, on the tier issue. But if you want them to be more aggressive, you've got to talk to them. We've got to figure out whether we want to make those changes. That's a, that's a big change, but the good news is it's going to happen. And then the director is committed to this, and so is Melissa. Um, and then the independent assessment costs, um, we John, may... Yes. Let me uh, let me recognize Representative Farrar for a question. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, you were you were talking about tiers. We have tiers now, do we not? I mean, that's it, they're not they're not in a cap. It's not in a cap tier system where you're get, you're allocated a certain amount, and that's you can, you don't go over the cap, and it's based upon an assessment that mm -hmm. drives those tiers. So the assessment would flow into those tiers. They can describe for you exactly what they do today, but it's not that same system. Okay, so they're not. I guess what I'm hearing from you, they're not using the caps now. I mean, using the tiers now. Well, I, I think, you know, at some point they can address that, how, okay. whatever they use. All right. So let's wait to the But the, te the Tennessee model has caps, and the independent assessment drives the tier, the plan of care, with the working with the providers. And that's something, you know, we talked at length with them. Richard may have other information on that. I think the basic difference is, is that my understanding of the DD waiver in this state regardless of tier, if you're waiver eligible, you're eligible to the maximum amount of expenditure, which I think is 65000 So you bait right now. In other states, absolutely. if you use, for instance, the SIS, um, which they use in Tennessee, they have three tiers. Virginia uses the SIS. These are all operant programs approved by CMS. They have six tiers. Um, the state needs to determine how they're going to do that in, in detail. But if you're in, if you're waiver eligible and you have X number of ADL needs, uh, you get X amount of, up to X amount of dollars. If you have two or three more, you get X plus one. Mm -hmm. If you have the highest level before pervasive and institutional level of care, you get X plus two. So what we're doing right now, the, we're, our, if we're doing independent assessment, everybody goes into tier three. Uh, there's not a, we don't tier them right now, even though we have it in place. We did not find a specific method that identified how much money was paid for each individual beneficiary based on the assessment. Okay. All right. Thanks. Which is going to be an important change, Representative, for them, and that I think you'll and we believe is going to be cost savings in that because I think you're going to find, you know, we, again we we recommend a right place, right service, right time, making sure that the setting is is important and all these issues are looked at through your assessment. Ah, uh, thanks. So we have a tier, I guess my question is we're having a tier system, we have a tier system set up now that could save us this money without doing any further any further changes you but we're just not utilizing it I guess that's what I'm asking um you don't have the independent assessment okay so you don't have the assessment instrument the independent instrument that's validating the the type of service amount of, you know amount of service and then working with the providers on the plan of care you don't have that in place today okay all right and they can answer the rest of it so that's all, right. all going to be tied to and then you're going to be allocated a cap allotment based upon that level of tier, whatever tier you're in. Okay. That's now, now I'm through. Thank you. And that's where they're going. Um, the other, you know, the independent assessment cost, it's not, you know, we, we'll need to talk to the department further, I think, on the independent assessment for the DD, because we may need to change that on fiscal 18 costs. But I want to I talk to them one more time. But you've got your net DD savings have gone from the last meeting we had it was the screening change that took it from 140 plus million to somewhere around 205 million. So the DD program itself, savings, non-HDC, non-HDC is a $205 million based estimated savings off a of baseline. 
and that's what it is in your plan. Um, and we may, you know, you may want to add more if, if, if the department answers questions, Representative Gray, on some of your independent assessment issues, and we can talk about that further. Um, hey, John, excuse me. Representative Hammer, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Refresh my memory, John, in your assessment of all the agencies and the assessments that they're supposed to be using, was it that they were there and not being utilized or the mechanisms for them to be there were not there and we're now putting those things in place in order to, to be able to uh, move forward? Which was it? If, if I understand your question correctly, uh, Representative, it's the latter. They didn't have the mechanisms in place to translate the assessment into um, a package of services related to the person's individual needs for adult daily living supports uh, that was equated with a specific range of dollars. Right. So they, some and of some of the agencies be added in yeah. the future. So yeah, some of the agencies didn't have them in place. I just want to know: Did some of the agencies have them in place and just weren't utilizing them? Already had the authority, already had everything in place, but weren't utilizing them, or was it a mixture of both? If, if I understand your question correctly, DD had some of the elements in place. Behavioral health did not. DDTSC and CHMS were basically free form fee for service. Do you know, were they, are they in the, and maybe this be an agency question, do you know for a fact that they are now in the plans that have been submitted to CMS moving forward and that, and that the mechanisms have been submitted to CMS in most current plans? I think that the department is going to have to update you as of today, but, uh, and this is in our final report, this is somewhat complex. The DD program has been dealing with basically three things at one time. One of them is, is to continue the current waiver going back to Jan at least January of this year. There have been negotiations with CMS to continue the current waiver. In that context, they have been trying to resolve the issue of independent case management required by the November 2014 yeah. HCB rules changes, and they've been trying to add some additional slots for child welfare children. CMS has been going back and forth with them on them for over a year. I think they're close to or have reached resolution on that. While that was going on, and I believe this started during the summer when we raised our concerns about independent assessment, et cetera, and, and you did as well, um, they started negotiations with CMS about that while they were still trying to get continuation approval on their current waiver beyond the existing 90 to 90 to 90 days they were dealing with. CMS told them, as I understand it, resolve the current waiver. We don't want you to put in a second waiver, a new waiver. We want you to amend the existing waiver that CMS had not given them a a uh, regulatory uh, uh, amount of time for an additional extension, which in some cases could be five years. In this case, it may have been one year. They would have to fill in the details. So specifically, I don't think they have submitted an amendment yet to the existing waiver that I believe is still in negotiations for continuation into a longer extended period of time to address the tiers. That is part of their plan. And I think that they'll be able to update you on the details of those dates and any errors I may have made in my explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So continuing on, um, if you look at the behavioral health savings, $215 million basically, we've already spent two meetings going over all of those changes. The care coordination costs on the behavioral health side is really critical to making sure those savings happen. The department has cost estimated that out at $21 million a year, once operational full year. Um, this, is, this is an add back because it's a cost, but $215 million is the total net savings in the behavioral health based on the changes. If you look at that $15 million behavioral health savings this year, that was OMIG, to their credit, coming out on the group psychotherapy rule change and the rates, and that's the, air, that's the one that I may have to adjust downward a few million dollars because the rate change didn't go through. But the cap did go through, and that's still going to generate substantial savings at the end of the year, this fiscal year, current. So behavioral health's already started. Um, you've got $215 million total net. And then when you start looking at the dental, 
I may have to adjust that $5 million because of the delay. It wasn't so much the delay, but basically we, we just put a much more aggressive timeline in there, than, and, and that's fine. DHS is going to start this program January 18, 2018. Um, dental premium tax, and then you get that. And then Elder, um, Director Cloud and the Nursing Home Administration and the Nursing Home Group and the Assisted Living Groups have been working together on the MOU. As you know, um, they already testified, and, and to their credit, the director has, has been able to really move forward on pushing better assessments and better front end um, review to bring that bring some of those savings to you this year. That's going to achieve about 15 million, and then that 250 million is what the total agreement was. We think that could even be more if it's done well, and it's something we want you to track. Um, then you, we talked about pharmacy, and then you can see the net fiscal impact. And this is your this is your impact, and I know that Representative Gray, you asked once about you know the care coordination component. That's the overlay. That's what we don't have here yet. Um, but to do this, to make these changes, to bring in the independent assessment, to have an independent care coordination um, or, or care coordination, but not to have the claims payment, not to have the, the overseer, and maybe just having DHS run the programs, $963 million to their credit. And that's, that's just, again, an estimate that you know, we've worked out, and Stephen on our team's done all the modeling with the department. We feel really comfortable with that. But again, that could change depending upon what happens in the next few months. Um, so, but when we, we got, and this might be something to, to do to start at the lunch break, Representative Collins, but now what I want to do is to go into that care management model, and that's how we'd end up. And so you'll see the two different savings models. So basically, this so, is your uh, look, do nothing kind of, or continue on, uh, do no care management. I'm sorry, John. I just, uh, this this sheet you've got before we leave this, it, it seems like it is. It's kind of the scorecard, the template for a scorecard that we want to track against. Because yes, um, you know, again, the, the blended five-year rolling is you know achieves the targets. Um, there's even a little slack in there. Hopefully, we don't need the slack. You know, that that kind of rolling rolling five years, averaging about 900 million. So, you know, from a tracking tool for a legislator or anyone else, it seems like this chart is really that top line dashboard. Is that a fair assessment of what we've got here? Yes, yes. And th then if, in this one I said, when I said not to, if they don't do anything in the area of behavioral health and DD, care core, um, the capitated model or the provider led model, and just continue on the road they're continuing, you, you're still going to achieve these savings, we believe. A reasonable number here is 963. Correct. Okay. So are we, are we at a decent breaking place, or do you have something that will go about 10, 10 minutes? If you've got a, a 10 minute thing, I don't want to, like, or 15 minute, I don't want to, I just want to make sure we, we start I mean, lunch think, by noon. I think it's important to just finish this up then because all right, let's do it. Then the DHS can come in and respond to it because all we're talking about now is taking this model, and Stephen has done a lot of research on other states' savings off of admin costs and I know Representative Farrer early on in managed care was talking about what their admin is and what we tried to take okay what are the savings that we felt comfortable with that capitated full risk would achieve and then what would be the savings that we would feel comfortable with that the provider led model would achieve based on other state experiences and those models are going to take time to roll out if they go forward you're not going to be voting on them the only vote is to say we, we, we recommend this, but we also recommend a care coordination overlay model for DHS to move forward on. And that's, that's what they're doing. So the next few slides are looking at those two different models. And one is their provider-led model. And we have used a 5% savings target. And we feel that that's probably, if it, it could be achievable, it's going to need a lot of work on their part, working with providers. Um, and that's off of that halo and representative Irwin that's that that other those other costs sometimes you don't see but keeping folks off of high cost settings out of high cost settings as well uh, uh, good good medication management these are additional savings and but you have to have a coordinator you have to have a team in place you have to really focus on some of the higher cost individuals in a very high touch if you want to call it 
um, system. So this would achieve about 5%, and you're going to see 1.159 added. So you've got about 118, uh, not, I think it's, a, yeah, somewhere around 118 million added. But you've got to remember, this is behavioral health and, and DD um, only. So behavioral health and DD only and the provider tax, we get you to about 1.159 million in savings. I mean, billion, excuse me. Thank you, Stephen. But that, that could be more or it could be less. But we are just using that 5% target. We looked at Colorado. We looked at um, Oregon and other states. Stephen can answer any of those questions on the model. But basically, that, and you also, I want to make one point, provider tax. You're going to have to change some laws, I think, if you go down this road to create a provider tax situation. Um, it may, you may. So that's something you want to watch if you want to make sure the provider tax is achieved. Excuse me, premium tax. Does everybody recognize that? There, there may be a premium tax legislative change needed here. And the department was looking into that, and they, I don't think that issue has been resolved. Okay? And then the next one is the capitated full risk for behavioral health and DD. And that's the 8.07 savings estimate that we used already in the past based upon uh, an average or look at other states. And I think Louisiana was one of the ones that we saw a good experience and, and we use it. And then the capitated full risk additional savings amount is here. And it's a $1.284 billion net five-year savings. So Representative Collins, that's, that's why I wanted to kind of conclude on those two areas and maybe have the department react after lunch, unless there's any questions. Um, so just to summarize the, the three scorecards you gave us, scorecard one is the work in process. We continue moving down with the plan, continue the arm wrestling, assume we win the arm wrestles. Option two is a managed care approach which limits the bidders to Arkansas provider owned. That improves our savings by 200 million over five years. And option three is managed care, not limited to Arkansas bidders or provider owned. And that saves us another 100 million potentially if we were to go that route. Is that an overly simplified assessment of the three uh, savings directions? Yeah, I think that's very, very fair. Yeah, that's a good assessment. And again, it's based upon, you know, a number of factors happening in the next few years. S Senator Irvin, you're recognized for a question. So, so just the 963 is the current on page five, and then you're adding to the 963 number to get to the 1.1 or 1.2, or if you did the diamond care route, it would be 963 plus whatever. Is that right? Yeah, uh, okay. halo, halo type savings. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify for me. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So, you, John, you're done walking us through your part, and you're ready for after lunch for DHS to come up. Is that I, correct? I think it would be appropriate to have them come up and address these issues before we move on to section four of the, of the final report, but that's the heart of okay. section three in the final report, All right. roadmap. All right, so what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna recognize Representative Meeks for a question, and then, uh, then we're gonna break for lunch at uh, 1245. Then we're going to uh, be back here at 115, and uh, we'll begin with DHS and their response to this final report information uh, when we come back at 115. Representative Meeks, you're recognized for a question. Actually, Mr. Chair, it's a, it's a point of personal privilege, if I may. You may. Well, Representative Collins has been so successful at leading this particular health care task force that I'm hearing rumors that the Navy football team is going to task him with figuring out what happened in the game last Saturday so that they can <laughs> return to their normal dominance of Army. By the way, go Army as a Army veteran. I am proud of what they did on Saturday. So, Representative Collins, I'm, I'm not sure if that rumor is true or not, but 
<laughs> congratulations. I don't know if I if I could help Navy, uh, but I think it's a wonderful thing. And glad Army won. I I've got two sons in Army ROTC and uh, at Arkansas in the National Guard, and so I'm giving them all the credit since they're now in the Army. It's about time they turned it around on us. Exactly. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We're adjourned until 1:15.